Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our September 2022 Community Breakfast. Um, my name is Karen King. I am with the Office of New Haven Affairs. Our office hosts these breakfasts every month, typically on the first Thursday of the month. Um, all of our breakfasts feature a member of the Yale community, a, a Yale student, staff, or faculty person who are talking about their areas of expertise, a topic that um, they want to share with the community, or they're sharing a resource one of the many resources that are available to um, members of the public. Um, I have a few announcements before we get started on our presentation. Um, as you can see from my screen, I am sharing the Office of New Haven Affairs website. I encourage you to visit the website. I will put uh, all of these links in the chat. So visit our website to learn more about what we do. We also um, uh, have events posted, et cetera. So lots of great information for you to check in with um, throughout the course of the year. Uh, a few events coming up, one, uh, two that are hosted by the Bainuki Library. The first is on September 17th. Um, they're going to be hosting a public viewing of archival materials um, uh, from the historic Dixwell Avenue Congregational United Church of Christ. This is the oldest African-American congregational UCC church in the world. That event is taking place on September 17th at 1. Um, and that will take place at the Bainuki Library on at 121 Wall Street, free and open to the public. Uh, so I will share a link with this um, deeper description and so that you can learn more. Uh, we, uh, the Bainuki Library hosts the Wyndham, Wyndham Campbell Prizes. Uh, Wyndham Campbell Prizes are an annual award. They choose a number of um, literary recipients to receive unrestricted grants of $165,000 to help support their writing careers. Um, this year's uh, prize recipients feature eight um, uh, uh, writers from around the world in various genres. All of them will be here in person uh, for the annual Wyndham Campbell Prize Festival. Uh, which will take place this year from September 19th through 22nd. Um, I will share a link to the calendar, uh, which kicks off on the 19th with a public talk um, on campus. So I encourage you to uh, follow the link to learn more about these amazing writers. And I encourage you to come out um, for these, um, these very personal and interactive talks. Uh, the one more thing I'd like to share, which we are very excited about, which is um, on October 1st, we are Yale University and um, the Connecticut NAACP are co-hosting the Harmony Classic. This is the Yale versus Howard game. This game will feature a number of um, events and activities that are open to the public, uh, such as a job fair, a health fair, um, uh, uh, prizes will be awarded, uh, so there is a ceremony there, and also this will feature a, um, a halftime battle of the bands between the Yale Marching Band and the Howard Marching Band, band which is going to be a great highlight. So um, I will put this in the description. I encourage you to come out. Their um, ticket prices are between $5 and $20. I encourage you to come out, bring your family for what promises to be a fantastic day, especially that halftime show with the both of the marching bands. Um, so on to our speaker, uh, Kate Cooney, PhD, MSW, grew up in Washington, DC in the 70s and 80s. The stark economic differences between neighborhoods in the DC area of that era inspired a deep interest and curiosity about cities, inequality, racial injustice, and American history as it pertains to current urban landscapes. She created and conceived of the in Inclusive Economic Development Lab course at the Yale School of Management and the City Scope podcast. Prior to joining the faculty at Yale uh, School of Management, Dr. Cooney was on the faculty at Boston University teaching courses on nonprofit management, urban poverty and economic development, and community and organizational analysis. Dr. Cooney received her graduate degrees from the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. Please help me welcome Dr. Kate Cooney. Welcome, Kate. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm just going to share my screen. Is that a clean view of my slides? Okay, great. Um, 
So again, thank you for the introduction, Karen, and the invitation to join you this morning. I thought I would use my time to give you a bit of context about the Inclusive Economic Development Lab uh, at the Yale School of Management, and then share a little bit about one of the new economic development tools, the Neighborhood Trust, that we studied in this past uh, spring 2022 lab class. Uh, as Karen said, I have been at Yale for um, 10 years. Prior to that, I was at uh, Boston University. And my research focuses on inclusive economic development in US cities. And at this stage of my career, I'm really interested in publishing research with the aim to influence public policy, to bring awareness to a general public about new knowledge and to open dialogues and create spaces to work together with neighborhood, city, state, and national actors to build a more equitable society. I'm interested in research that focuses on developing new understandings of how existing processes reduce economic mobility for groups with racial, ethnic, and gendered identities, and identifying key mechanisms that lead to more just processes and systems in urban governance networks, in labor markets, and in organizations. Um, earlier work focused on double and triple line business models, bottom line business models that incorporate social and environmental goals and how these organizations endeavor to balance commercial and social goals and the scale and effectiveness of these kind of private system change efforts. Here at Yale, as a senior lecturer, I teach a set of electives that directly correspond to my research. Um, and the Inclusive Economic Development Lab, which I'm here to talk about this morning, has its roots in an academic class, 536, Urban Poverty and Inclusive Economic Development in US Cities, or as the students call it, UPED. <laughs> um, I've taught since 2016. Uh, and in this class, I assign the students a final project of their choosing to examine some of the themes of the course more closely. Uh, some do case studies, some do empirical work. And as happens in a city the size of New Haven, a few years ago, one day I met a parent on the sidelines of a soccer practice who was a researcher at Yale, Annie Harper. And she had been doing some work with the Financial Empowerment Center here in the city. So a few years ago, she and I began designing some opportunities for a few of those students in 536 to opt into a final project that she and I designed um, to help uh, the city with some of the work they were doing in launching the Financial Empowerment Center. So that first year, uh, the students in 536 who did that project worked on a report mapping out the availability of different types of financial services for New Haven residents, showing the availability of banking and other types of financial services throughout the city. And they also did some focus groups to understand the barriers to establishing banking relationships versus high fee cash checking or pawn shop use. Um, The next year, a group of students analyzed the marketing materials for the Financial Empowerment Center. And they researched examples of other financial empowerment centers in other cities, such as Denver and New York City, to bring some of the best practices for connecting more New Haven residents into the services at the FEC by designing posters that, for example, instead of just showing the mayor or the text about the services actually highlighted the aspirations and goals of the residents um, as a way to help residents get excited to connect to those services. And they also developed a social media marketing strategy that Annie reported the city found very useful. Um, in the final year of our collaboration, there was a team that worked on a white paper to lay out the methodological challenges to establishing an estimate of the debt load carried by New Haven residents as a, in aggregate. And this is something that many cities were endeavoring to, um, to analyze. And after a few years of designing these opportunities, I was struck by the quality of the students' work 
And I wish that in some instances, like with the debt mapping paper, I had a mechanism for sharing out the work beyond just grading it, you know, for a class deliverable, because I felt like other people could really benefit from the work that was coming out of these, th these projects. So that led me, inspired me to launch the Inclusive Economic Development Lab, which is run as a course, and it's kind of an adjunct, you know, a follow-on to the more academic explorations we do in 536. Um, it's offered every spring, and we began in spring 2019. Um, and in thinking about launching the Inclusive Economic Development Lab, I was really thinking about the different ways that universities engage with the communities in which they're located. Um, I know that I understand that Kerwin Charles, the Dean of the School of Management will be coming in the next few months to speak with you about this new center for inclusive growth, which as I understand will likely build out from some of these traditional anchor strategies um, where the university or hospital considers how to align its role as a purchaser, workforce developer, or cluster anchor to benefit local communities. But for me in the Inclusive Economic Development Lab, which isn't related to this new Center for Inclusive Growth, right? we, we predate that center, although of course we've been in conversation and sharing uh, the work that we've been doing. Um, the lab is organized around opportunities for the university and its communities to construct and share knowledge collectively, right? So it's inspired by this idea of co-creating knowledge through networks and capacity building and combining the multidisciplinary expertise of the university with the lived experience of communities in order to build and mobilize urban knowledge and craft evidence-based urban policy. Our first lab in 2019 was organized around the exploration of this new Opportunity Zone program. The Opportunity Zone program is uh, an initiative where the federal government offers tax incentives for capital gains tax relief if those capital gains are invested in these newly designated Opportunity Zones. Um, these are low income census tracts that were identified throughout the United States. New Haven has about seven tracks that are located in the Hill, Fairhaven, Dixwell, New Hallville, and Worcester Square. So we designed the lab in such a way where the students interviewed people from around the country to learn how cities were getting ready for this new Opportunity Zone program. And in the spirit of sharing out what we were learning and not just keeping it in the seminar room, we created a podcast, the City Scope podcast, so others could listen into those conversations uh, and learn from them. Here you see a list of the people we interviewed and to share the conversations in as many ways as possible. We also collaborated with Sci City in an inclusive economic development speaker series. So the people we invited to campus would speak in our classroom, would go down to the podcast studio and we would interview them. And then we would walk across the street to a room that Oni Ochiaba, at Sci, who was at Sci City at the time, had set up um, and they would give their talk a third time <laughs> to, the, to the community. Here's a list of uh, the organizational affiliations of folks who attended that speaker series. So maybe some of you were there. And here's a short video uh, which features the student perspective on that inaugural year. Give me the thumbs up if you can hear it. The Inclusive Economic Development Lab is a new course at the Yale School of Management which gives students the opportunity for a hands-on uh, learning experience with the city of New Haven.
The Yale SOM mission is educating leaders for business and society. And I think that this course really emphasizes the and society part. It was really centered this time around opportunity zones and really to teach us what opportunity zones are, how we could use them, and then try to apply that to the city of New Haven. So we split up into teams and focused on some neighborhoods that were designated as opportunity zones and reached out to the community and tried to figure out exactly how they could utilize this uh, new incentive. We went through, we kind of got a feel um, on our own of what assets do these have, what you know, what are the anchors, what are, what are the uh, restaurant scenes look like, you know, what, is, what are the things that people would come to New Hallville for and also what are they lacking, what didn't we see, which was, ended up being like a lot of small retail where we saw an opportunity. So in the back of our minds we started thinking about what could these, what could we do, which of the models that we were studying in class. I think we have an advantage as students to be able to take the time to really think strategically about what could come of opportunity zones and really think about some of the consequences of them as well. Um, also, especially being from the finance side of things, being able to look at it and say, okay, how much money do we think this business could make? When do we think someone could see a return? What kind of creative financing could you use to make this work, to make this economical in the neighborhood? So we had four different models, uh, food halls, uh, affordable housing, maker spaces, um, and the last one was business development slash creative financing. Um, and those models were really four different concepts brought to us uh, by different people presenting um, and explained to us uh, how they utilize those models in, in their respective towns. We went to a community management team meeting and met with some of their leaders and really talked to them about what do they want to see in their neighborhood, what kind of businesses are missing, um, why do they think they're missing, that type of thing. We spend a lot of time walking into businesses in the neighborhood, like looking around, doing some research. Um, and what was really interesting was seeing how motivated the community members were to really take advantage of, uh, of things like Opportunity Zones and how much they really wanted to own what was being put into their neighborhood. I think any chance that students get to get out of the classroom and really let the rest of the city come into view is a valuable experience for them. I think really helped them understand the kind of knowledge that exists in these communities and how important it is to take the time to, uh, to engage prior to doing any kind of work in these communities. You really want to give back, right? You need to make people's lives better and just basic quality of life. And I think that's what this course is doing. And to have an opportunity to do that in New Haven proper, where the Yale School of Management is, is the perfect place to begin that mission. I think it's going to be tough to find a similar course uh, somewhere else. Uh, I think it's very closely tied to the mission uh, because, because it's really to the end society part. Uh, and it was really great for us uh, to actually have a course allowing us to engage with the society and the community here. The thing that I got the most out of the course was really getting to engage with the community members and it made me want to do, to do more of that, to really understand what different individuals see as missing in their area and what they would like to see happen. There is an ongoing conversation, which is I think one of my favorite parts of this course is that what we took from the class, the presentation and the knowledge, I pass that on to decision makers and it's actionable. And I think for me that was a huge draw to the course and something that I'm particularly proud of. Um, so from that first year, getting ahead a bit here, let me go back. There we go. Uh, we've run three additional labs since that first year, focusing on opportunity zones, uh, organized under different themes. So in 2020, our theme was rethinking community engagement. In 2021, our theme was supporting and scaling black owned and black led businesses. And in 2022, the lab we just finished, our theme was infrastructure uh, inequity. We now have vision statement for the lab. Um, we're organized under the vision that the work of inclusive economic development requires bold action, mobilizing narratives, community engagement, and alliances across unlikely partners, right? It's gonna take all of us working together to build a more equitable future. Um, we bring together academics, practitioners, students, local stakeholders to explore a different topic related to inclusive economic development each spring. 
And we aim to be a place where practitioners, public officials, academic students, and engaged citizenry can come together and learn together about cutting edge practices and scholarship on inclusive economic development with the aim to develop insight analysis and models for action. Um, but sometimes we, uh, in addition, we, um, we work with, so every year we have produced a podcast that uh, shares out our learnings, just like we did in that first year. And in addition, we look for ways to partner with community stakeholders, city stakeholders who are working in the area of our theme and look for opportunities where students working in a short-term capacity could, um, could be helpful. So this is our season four of the CityScope podcast, which is the interviews that we did for the Infrastructure and Equity Lab. And those will be, that's in production right now. And so that later this month in September uh, will be coming out. And so we talked with practitioners and academics around the country working on history and new trends in community benefit agreements, which are a way that infrastructure and, and development can be bent toward uh, maximizing community benefits. Uh, we learned about some new work research related to how transit oriented development can produce more benefit or when it, you know, what are the factors that lead it to produce less community benefit. Um, we, we interviewed someone who's got a new book on the role of community in urban governance networks, which is a really interesting look at the role of community organizations in some transit oriented development in Boston. Um, we learned all about this new neighborhood trust tool for economic development, which I'll say more about in a few minutes. And we did some work on adaptive reuse of public infrastructure. So those are the conversations we'll be sharing. And then alongside that in the lab, the students look for these opportunities to partner with local stakeholders and share the learnings from these interviews and studies with actors in the city working on associated projects. So some of the projects that we did um, this past spring included working with the parking authority to develop a white paper on the trends in community benefit agreements to help inform the Union Station redevelopment bidding process. Um, we also worked with a community advisory group in the Whaley, Edgewood, uh, Beaver Hills area who had organized around revitalizing the Gulf Street Armory. And we created a report laying out a process for redevelopment of the Gulf Street Armory, as well as some back of the envelope pro formas for two options for redevelopment to show sort of the economics of um, what could be possible. And then what I'm gonna spend a little more time talking about is this new economic development tool that we studied called the Neighborhood Trust. Um, and in this case, we didn't have a local stakeholder that we were working with explicitly. So our approach was for the student team to develop two case studies and then produce a podcast to disseminate our work for those interested in learning more. And um, we attended some of the community management team meetings to, um, hold, to announce both the, the work that we were doing, lead people to, to the website that we were building. And we also held some information sessions, one in person at the main branch of the library and one virtual, um, just to share out in as many ways as possible some of the things we are learning about this, this new tool. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, that content now. Uh, so we have a website, which is iegl.yale.edu. And we, uh, all of the work that comes out of the lab, most of it, sometimes if we're working very directly with a client, then it's a kind of private deliverable. But where we can, we try to make as much of the content that we're producing available for um, all of the local stakeholders and national stakeholders who are interested in learning about our work. Um, so those are just hanging on our website and you can visit them there, but I'll show you what happens if you click on the Neighborhood Trust, say a little bit more about 
that particular deliverable from this spring 2022 lab. So the neighborhood trust is um, a, a kind of brainchild of Joe Margulis, who is a law professor at Cornell. And he recently wrote a book entitled, Thanks for Everything, Now Get Out. And he's talking about, um, in the book, he focused on Olneyville, which is a predominantly Latin, Latino neighborhood in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, Oneyville experienced what many urban neighborhoods experienced in the second half of the 20th century. Neighborhoods that were once thriving, dense neighborhoods full of businesses and households connected to the industrial jobs of the city gave way to job loss due to deindustrialization. In Olneyville, that was the textile industry, um, white flight, rise in crime, highway construction and urban renewal. And one of the things that Joe Margulies noticed when he was doing some work in this neighborhood was that there's actually considerable resources flowing into that neighborhood, um, money, but it was money coming in from outside the area and the people who were deciding what to do with that money often didn't live in the neighborhood. Um, and, on, and as well, even if revitalization occurs because residents want amenities and better housing stock, um, the concern is that it kicks off this gentrification and displacement dynamic as property values and rent values rise, which then make it unaffordable for low-income residents to stay. So that's Joe's point. Thanks for everything, now get out. Uh, and he's sort of puzzling about that. That can't be our model in this country. Like surely we could do better than that. Um, so he came up with this idea of the neighborhood trust. And we, so we read his book, we learned about it, we interviewed him. And then um, we heard about two places in the United States that were experimenting with the neighborhood trust. So one is in Philadelphia, the Kensington Corridor Trust, and the other is in Austin, uh, which is the Austin Cultural Trust. Um, so on our website, we sort of talk through what's the difference between a neighborhood trust and the community land trust, which people might be more familiar with, um, and lay out a kind of side-by-side -side analysis of what, what those differences are. Um, and then we highlight these two different case studies. So uh, the main thing I'll say here, and then we can go to Q and A, is that um, in the community land trust, you're separating the land from the building on top of the land. Um, and so the land becomes community owned. And when you're selling, let's say a house, that's a community land trust, um, the house is sold at lower price because you're not selling both the house and the land together, like, like typical real estate is, is sold. And so you're only, you're only purchasing the house. And then the community that owns, you know, that's part of that governance of the trust can make rules about how much that price in that housing can go up at each turnover of ownership. So what's attractive about community land trusts is that they can decommodify housing a bit and increase uh, affordability. But some of the critiques are that people can't participate fully in the wealth building opportunities that can come with housing. So um, the neighborhood trust is a different animal, right? The neighborhood trust doesn't do anything like separate the the property from the from the land. It's a trust, like you could think about a trust fund, right? It's structured as a perpetual purpose trust. And as a trust, it can purchase assets, it can receive assets. And the distinction with the neighborhood trust is that the neighborhood trust is set up as a perpetual purpose trust where the purpose is neighborhood revitalization, let's say. I mean, you would define the purpose. Um, once you define your, the purpose, it's, it's ironclad. And so with the Philadelphia example, they're taking their time defining that, that purpose. Um, 
Uh, and so let me just explain what, what is happening in Philadelphia first, because it's the closest to what Joe Margulies was imagining. And I'll show you the materials we have here. So we interviewed Ariana Abizade, who is the first executive director of the Kensington Corridor Trust. Uh, the Kensington Corridor is a neighborhood in Philadelphia that's been quite impacted by the opioid crisis. And um, there's been a lot of community organizing to produce a neighborhood vision for the neighborhood. And so in that process, there was a kind of interest in what Joe Margulies was writing about. Um, so they are, in this case, thinking about a perpetual purpose trust, a neighborhood trust that's focused on 1.4 um, miles of the commercial corridor that runs through that neighborhood. And the trust will acquire properties and try to own everything in that small part of the commercial corridor. And so they're purchasing vacant land to develop as well as um, mixed use buildings that are have housing and, and retail. And what's really interesting about the neighborhood trust approach is that you could, the, the neighborhood could decide to develop affordable housing and develop retail space at very low rent to help launch entrepreneurs from the neighborhood. But you, they could also decide to have market rate housing and have very high rent paying restaurants from New York City, let's say, um, because all of the cash flows go to the trust. And so then the neighborhood would still have a growing set of cash flows into the trust that the neighborhood could decide what to do with, right? So that's what's a kind of interesting aspect to this approach. Um, so with the Kensington story, there were a group of partners that came together to study this neighborhood trust idea and to, um, to launch it. And so those four partners were um, a CDC that had done a lot of work in the neighborhood, um, the PIDC, which is like a Public Private Economic Development Corporation in Philadelphia, um, uh, impact and uh, mission oriented private developer who had done a lot of work in that neighborhood, and then a small business incubator called the IF Lab, which focused on supporting and scaling um, African American and Latino businesses. And so these four actors came together. Um, did some planning, hired Ariana Abizade as the executive director, and she quickly transferred governance over to the community. Um, and so we, we asked her a series of really technical questions about what does the governance look like? How are they financing their acquisition of properties? how are they building capacity to understand the technical dimensions of the work and so forth. So we've organized the website into frequently asked questions with a video uh, answer, you know, but you could also just listen to the straight interview all the way through if you don't want to click around. Um, and we tried to lay out what were some of the key aspects of what the Philadelphia neighborhood is exploring uh, through their work. And they're very clear that they are learning as they go and they're translating this theory into practice. Um, and they are really interested in sharing out what they're learning with other folks in other cities who are exploring uh, doing something similar. And in fact, we were able to connect a group in Dixwell, New Hallville who um, were interested with Ariana and they've had an information call and so forth. And then the other example that case study that we developed is working more at the city level. Um, and this is the Austin Cultural Trust. 
And so um, we spoke with Anne Gatling Haynes, who maybe some of you remember, she actually worked here in New Haven um, at the EDC, I believe, uh, maybe in its early years. Uh, she's now down in Austin. And so the mission of the Austin Cultural Trust is to support and preserve the arts, culture, and music spaces at a time when there's extreme gentrification occurring in uh, the city. And so I think Willie Nelson's recording studio was under pressure. There was, um, there was a building called the Music Lab that was a rehearsal space for local musicians that had been there for 30 years. Um, in 2021, one of its locations closed and became a Tesla showroom. And there are other I can't, iconic venues that everyone wants to preserve, such as Antoine's Nightclub, which was Austin's home of the blues and housed B.B. King, Muddy Waters, Jimmy Reed, uh, Ray Charles, James Brown, and many others. So as these, on the one hand, these are the reasons why people love Austin. And on the other hand, all these cultural and uh, music and art spaces are under extreme financial pressure. So in this case, it was a group of um, arts and culture organizations that came together and asked the city for help. Um, and so what was set up here is something uh, similar in its concept, but really different in its execution, right? So in the Austin example, um, the idea is to, to acquire some of these cultural arts and music assets to preserve affordability, um, to create new creative facilities. And it's set up as a very responsive body to uh, this matrix, the citywide network of existing cultural and art stakeholders. Um, so it's the Austin Economic Development Corporation in which this Austin Cultural Trust is housed. And they had um, a lot of capital to work with. So there was almost 17 million committed by the city for initial investments. And 12 million of that came from a voter approved tax exempt city bond. They had an additional 2.4 million from a hotel occupancy tax, which they thought made sense because so much of the tourism is connected to those music and arts spaces. And then um, 2.5 from Austin city budget. And this is money that's gonna be allocated over I think a decade. So uh, they're not spending it all in a year, but um, they also have a pretty interesting governance structure in which there is a cultural trust advisory committee that sits on the EDC board of directors. And that committee, functions as a matrix because it has um, the Arts Commission, the Music Commission, all sitting on that board. And so each of those commissions have networks associated with them. So they describe it as a kind of spidey network where an alarm will go off if Willie Nelson's studio is gonna turn into a Tesla showroom and the, the art, the cultural trust might be able to respond. Um, so again, we have the frequently asked questions and um, the, full, the full interview here. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about as we produce these different artifacts that come out of each of our labs, as a faculty um, running this as a course primarily in its, in its um, you know, first four years, there's tension between wanting to stay involved and then moving on to design the next, the next lab. So I am excited to report that we just received a grant, a two-year grant from the Nyarcos Fund, which is run through the Yale Law School, um, to build out the capacity of the lab for the next two years. So for the next two years, and I'm talking to my dean about ongoing support after that grant winds down, um, I'm gonna have student research assistants working with me year round 
Um, I'm going to be able to fund a community liaison. We're looking into bringing SOM alumni fellows in to bolster some of the technical work that we do. Um, and so the idea is that there'll be students who could run workshops on some of the materials we've developed in earlier labs in an ongoing way. Because even though we are no longer studying actively opportunity zones, there may be stakeholders in New Haven who still are working on them and want to hear and learn from what we did. Um, so just a shout out that, um, and the other thing is that while we are putting everything on our website and trying to make it as available as possible through the podcast, sometimes it's just helpful to, to have a conversation about the materials we have and how what we're, we've been doing might, might resonate with the work that, that you're doing. Um, or design a workshop where we can present some of these materials, but have it be in conversation rather than just downloading from a website. So um, please reach out and let me know um, if there's work that you've heard about that's interesting or that you see later uh, because we're happy and we now have the capacity to um, design some more of those workshop and engagements through this grant that we've just received. So I'm gonna leave it there and happy to take any questions that you have. And thank you so much for your attention and, and time. Sure. Thank you, Kate. Um, so everyone now has the ability to unmute themselves. You can ask your questions directly by um, starting your question if no one else is speaking. You can also enter your question in the chat and I'm happy to read it and help moderate that way. Karen, I have a question, Alder Antunes. Hi, Alder Antunes. Good morning. Good morning. My question is, um, you talked about the communities in, in the city that are basically closed communities, the Black and Hispanic communities. But of course, it's a pretty large city for New England anyway. And we have many diverse areas. For instance, wards uh, 11, 12, and 13 are probably the most diverse wards in the city. But none of these activities or, or uh, programs come out this way. What kind of things can you do to, to make a change in that? Because it, we have no real minority businesses or activities out in these three communities where there are an awful lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, we are very open to conversations. We are currently designing our next, um, our next lab for spring 2024. And our theme is gonna be workforce development and the future of work. And so we are right now looking for um, partners and stakeholders. Uh, so I would welcome any follow-up conversations um, and we can, think together about ways that perhaps we can design an engagement for the spring semester uh, for some students to work on something that might be helpful in, in uh, the wards that you described. Thank you. Just to, to keep uh, Fairhaven Heights and Quinnipiac Meadows area, those are the, the three wards, the three areas that uh, seem to get as little service as possible from any type of these programs or grants. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I put Dr. Cooney's uh, contact information in the chat. And um, also in the chat is a comment from Paul, who says, great presentation. He would love to talk with you about the Grand Avenue Special Service District. So Paul, um, I encourage you to reach out to Dr. Cooney as well. Her email address for anyone who's on the phone and can't copy and paste is kate.cooney at yale.edu. You make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? While we're waiting, uh, Kate at the beginning of her talk mentioned that our, um, we have a speaker coming up. Um, as we do it next month. I encourage you to join us for October breakfast. Dr. Uh, Dean Curran Charles is from the Yale School of Management is going to be joining us. Um, he's leading talks about the development of the Center for Inclusive Growth 
Um, that center, as you may recall, was born out of um, the year long discussion with uh, members of the city of New Haven, which resulted in Yale um, increasing, significantly increasing our voluntary payment, but we also are um, donating $5 million toward the development of the Center of, of Inclusive Growth. And that uh, mission is to develop and implement strategies that will um, economically benefit um, all New Haven residents. Um, so I encourage you to come out to our October breakfast um, to learn more about that and to speak with uh, Dean Charles. Um, if you are not already on our mailing list, you can send me an email to karen.king at yale.edu. And I can make sure you get that announcement, that and future announcements as well. So with that, do we have any other questions? Uh, one question. Oh, go ahead, Althea. Good morning. Yeah, I was trying to type it because I, I don't know if I want to express it correctly. I was wondering how do you, home ownership to me is a key to community st stability. And how do you prevent uh, large groups coming in from other places using deceptive practices, buying up homes, and then turning them into Section 8 or uh, just renting them out, and, and then they deteriorate? Right. How do, you, how do you prevent that or curb it or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, in the more academic class that I teach, we, we look at some of the research in this area and um, there are some new papers coming out that are looking at the role of mega landlords in cities. Um, and so, you know, one insight from that literature is that on the one hand, um, you know, it's very hard to compete against these large capitalized um, firms that are acquiring properties in cities and single family homes uh, since the 09 housing related recession have become an asset class. Mm -hmm. And the thought was that maybe that would be temporary, but that seems to be continuing. And so there's a lot of pressure in cities because you have these very highly capitalized, sometimes hedge funds coming in and purchasing, as, as we well know in New Haven, <laughs> we've been the site of that activity for longer than other cities. Um, so on the one hand, it can be difficult to compete with them to acquire properties. Um, there is some research that suggests if you have a strong regulatory regime, large holder landlords tend to want to follow the law. And so in some way, in, in that regard, if you can strictly enforce your codes, that is a way that, that is, you know, an upside, if you want to think of it that way, of large holder landlords, because um, it's a single entity to deal with to enforce those codes. Um, but the larger question is how can how can New Haven residents move into into home ownership and um, make that uh, a more accessible pathway to more people? Um, and I know that there is some interesting uh, work being experimented in uh, in the city where they are developing duplexes and selling them at uh, the price of a single family. And then there's a built-in um, rent, rental income with those duplexes. Um, so those kind of initiatives show a lot of promise. Um, there are other things I've seen in other cities that um, link certain kinds of um, tax increases in market rate areas of the city. So property tax increases in places where um, the neighborhood is investing in market rate. There can be a percentage of those property tax increases that go into a fund to help uh, with affordability for other parts of the city. So there are policy mechanisms being experimented with um, and as well as these kind of 
practices of rehabbing and selling um, back to city residents. Something like neighborhood housing service has, has also been engaged in that kind of work. Um, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tough dynamic. And um, one of the things that we're hoping to do is create some workshops where we take some of the learnings from other cities and really help educate or share with residents what we're learning in the classroom about some of these interesting new approaches, because mm -hmm. we've learned that some of the best uh, ways to empower people is to provide them with that set of tools and to learn about what are what other cities are doing to to get in front of this. All right. Yeah, it just seems to be a big problem. Definitely. And, and a lot of deceptive practices of pretending to be a couple buying a home and then it's really a big conglomerate. Right. I think that should be illegal. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. well, uh, thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Sure. Thank you, Althea. Ms. Shaw. Um, some time ago, I used to read about where um, there was, uh, I don't know, a, a, a program rent to own where that was also uh, a way of helping people um, to build up, I guess, um, enough money for, uh, uh, for, for a down payment um, um, on a home. And the problem, I think, too, is that New Haven is such a low-income city that it's very hard to find um, potential um, uh, buyers who, who are residents without, you know, without that mortgage being extremely low. Um, and somehow if maybe the, um, the mortgage or the length of the mortgage is stressed out, stretched out such that, um, their monthly payments are lower. Of course, it also means that they're paying, they're paying interest probably for the rest of their lives, right. but but you know, but it you know, but hopefully, hopefully the equity on the home will catch up with with the interest. But that that that's other ways to try and um, keep, you know, um, uh, keep keep hopefully the, the the city in the hands of its residents, you know, as opposed to the large you know large companies, most of which are out of state, and you have a very very hard time of finding these, what are they, limited legal corporations. Right. But that's food for thought. Yes. Yes, one thing I've seen in the venture capital space is uh, even for high earners, it's very hard to buy into the Bay Area, let's say, or Boston housing market at this point. And the venture capital firms have started to create these mechanisms where they will share the down payment with, um, with that that individual or family and then take some of the 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 upside once that property um, changes hands and so i'm not suggesting that for for new haven but there may be some lessons we could learn or some iterations that we could um we could create using public money to do something something similar um, and I had another thought about what you were describing. Um, yeah, I think the affordable housing, the way we teach it is, and I know I've heard um, folks like Eric Clemens talk about it this way too, is there's affordable housing, but the affordability is also connected to income as, as you suggested and jobs. And so um, thinking about affordable housing as both a jobs issue, as well as a housing issue. and um, because we don't want to only build affordable housing as our way out of what's actually a jobs and income um, issue. Thank you. A uh, quick question in the chat uh, from Paul. Has this work inspired students' work choices? It has. It has. I'm really gratified to see that. Um, and I think I bring my own curiosity and excitement for learning just just as I've heard all of you talking about um, 
the, the deep questions that you have from your lived experience of, of living in cities. And, um, and I think the students um, get really excited by the guest speakers, by the content, and certainly through the lab, by then translating some of these things from the idea space into connections with community members who are working actively on these issues and noticing how much more complex it can be when the idea meets practice. Um, so I've heard in the past few years, there's a group of students who are connecting with each other, who meet each other, who have all been through one of these classes and um, now have a community of practice. And I think the podcast has also helped keep those communities together because they all tune in and listen. And then if I interview an SOM alum, they meet each other. Um, so it, it has, um, and that's really interesting to see. And there was a group of SOM students in the 1980s who were very interested in cities in the United States and in economic development, and they are now approaching retirement. And so I'm hoping to be able to use the lab to bring some of them in as fellows. Luna. Um, <laughs> to, uh, to bridge this current cohort of SOM students who are um, really engaged on these issues with that earlier group who were also very committed and spent their careers doing this kind of work. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, while we're on the topic, um, Augusta, um, thanks for sharing that as well. Um, but the universe, both the university and, and the hospital um, offer um, home buying support for uh, their employees. So for the, I can speak for the university in particular. So the university provides um, $30,000 um, for uh, new university employee, full-time university employees to purchase homes um, in uh, neighborhoods that can really benefit from home ownership. Uh, so there's more information on the Yale Home Buyer website. Um, so, and I know if you Google the hospital and home buyer, you will find information about that as well. Uh, you know what? It is almost closing time. So I want to take an, another opportunity to thank Kate for being our inaugural 2022 uh, Community Breakfast Speaker. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you all for um, joining us uh, this morning. I hope to see you. Uh, another round of applause for Dr. Cooney. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all you. so much. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be with you. And please reach out. Please reach Absolutely. out. Absolutely. So I, I will um, reach out to everyone who registered to share Kate's uh, contact information as well as all the links that I put in the chat. Um, I hope to see you all on October 6th when, where we will welcome uh, Yale School of Management Dean uh, Kerwin Charles. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hi, everyone. Thank you.